Bonesai Mirai, super excited to have you guys with us. Uh, we're going to run back something that we were attempting to pull off last week and, uh, and couldn't make it happen. We had some pretty horrendous weather, maybe the worst I've seen since I've been in Oregon on, in my seventh year. It's the first torrential freezing rain I've experienced. That was gnarly. It was gnarly. It was gnarly. Yeah. It was heavy. It was heavy. <laughs> While you guys were supposed to be watching the stream, I was chiseling ice out of our gutters because it was starting to back up underneath our roof. Anyways, um, forest, forest. forest creation, forest creation. So this is a long time in the making for us. We've actually been working on this project for probably going on a month now. And, uh, and to finally be at this point, I'm almost like vomiting. I'm so nervous. So um, why are you scared? <sighs> I've never seen anybody put something like this, this together in front of me. Um, I'm sure it's been done. I, I've just never witnessed it. And so to deliver this to you guys tonight in a really succinct way is going to be a very significant challenge. So I'm going to lean heavily on my sidekick, Kendall. What up? Um, we got Arthur, as always, in the production booth. Uh, Ricardo on the detail camera. And uh, tonight, for your viewing pleasure, we also have <laughs> Mr. Troy Cardoza the in the room. Guest, Troy in the house. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm just going to dive right into it. This is going to get pretty dirty and nitty gritty. Um, we've done a lot of the prep work and we did some extra footage like we did last week, but um, we'll show you that coming up. I wanted to start off though by just giving you guys a little bit of insight into the work that happens to go into anchoring the stone in the container. And if we can come in detail to Ricardo, um, he's going to show you as I rotate. Now, each of these stones is anchored to the container independently. And when you guys notice this, notice that no single piece of the stone anywhere in this composition is actually physically touching the container. So you can see the wood blocks here, and then actually below the wood blocks, it's tough to see because the drainage screen is black, but we also have a very uh, thick uh, gasket rubber underneath each of the wood blocks. So what that's basically doing is if we anchored these stones to the, directly to the container, the first time that you accidentally let go of this pot a little too soon, if you ever took it in a car and you hit a bump, that stone would actually fracture the ceramic and cause an immediate break. And it's, it's a pretty quick fate once you get stone bouncing around in this. So that wood block gives it a little bit of an organic buffer. Obviously the gasket rubber further buffering that. And anywhere, any stone that we have, we've drilled through the stone to be able to tie it down to the container. And we've tied each stone in three places. So you've got your kind of your tripod of pillars for stability. So now each of these stones, if I really wanted to, I could, I could probably, if I physically could, pick up the container by just grabbing any one of those stones. They're getting um, ready for the mega quake. They're, they're ready. They're <laughs> ready. They're ready. What, that, kinds that, of, what kinds of stones are these? So this is lace rock. This is lace rock that's sourced from St. George, Utah. This is kind of the stone that I had hoped. If you want to take us back out wide, Arthur, this is the stone that I had ultimately hoped to be able to use um, with the Utah juniper. And we just didn't find the right shape to gel with the tree. But um, we've come back with a vengeance with the local stone and um, we're going to be applying it to, to the beach forest this evening. So. Um, I want to take you guys into a little bit of the prep work that we use to get all of the trees ready. They're all sitting here packaged up nicely beside me. Uh, but the breakdown of the root system on a beach is very, very specific because beach, and I'm sure Kendall will follow this up a little bit later, um, beach is very easily scarred. It's a very soft bark, very smooth bark tree. So when we go and we start breaking down the root system, the amount of care that we've got to show to those roots is extremely significant and, and to the trunk that we're working alongside we as well. we don't want to scar it. Right. No scarring. No scarring. That's no the scarring. Goal. Yeah, a little bit of baby, finesse here. Baby smooth. Baby bark. smooth. Baby smooth bark. Okay, so Arthur, if you want to take them away to that clip of the root system when we're breaking it down, take a look here, uh, enjoy this, and we'll come back and catch you guys after this. Out. Make sure your hands are clean when you touch them. And uh, I don't know how hard these are going to be to get out. Once they're out, go ahead and stack those here. Let's, um, let's save the moss. We can use the moss for uh, 
top dressing. So let's save the moss. The bag, there's a, there's a bag in there that's already got it. It's heavy, it's up in that bin. It's the third one, it's the smallest one. And then what I want you to do at first, Troy, is just pull these, pull these root systems back. Now, if you hit a thick root, try not to go too deep because we don't want to hit the nabari. But what's happened is, is all of the soil's grown up over the trunk mm -hmm. and over the nabari. I just want to get down into the ballpark okay. before we start chopsticking. And this is pretty standard for, pretty standard for a deciduous tree. Once they run out of room going down, then they start accumulating roots going up. So we'll come back and we'll clean these, come back and clean these trunks after that bottom section is dried and we see how dirty it is wherever the soil was sitting. But we definitely don't want to scar those big, big roots. I honestly don't know what to expect with these. Like, are they going to have good roots? Are they going to have Good bases. I think this is going to be a beautiful, beautiful tree to anchor the composition with. So if you see any roots like this that are impeding your ability, to get around it, just go ahead and cut them, circling roots. I'm assuming each one's gonna have some of that because they've been in these for so long. And then we just wanna be sure to not scar that base. Oh. Because sure. anywhere that our chopstick leaves a mark on a beach, you're gonna see it for forever. ideally we would set these down flat and have the roots spread mm -hmm. okay so the shallower we can get it without bare rooting it the better it's always tough to know it's always tough to know where to stop, right, Troy? Where to stop? Where to stop, where to stop chopsticking and pulling yeah, back no, and cutting, right? There's no stop sign that says stop. Yeah, here. unfortunately not. No yield sign that says you need to proceed with caution. Danger. Point. <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of flexibility with, with deciduous trees, and in particular with yeah. beech are quite durable to root work, so pulling back so that we try to get the best spread of the roots. That's really ultimately what our motivation is here. Now these roots that are coming off like that, I mean, what is that? Is that really doing anything at all? I mean, there's nothing No, I mean, that. you know, it's the beginning of sort of the next round. If this tree were planted in the ground, those roots would then start to produce really fine tertiary root ramification, and it would be the next round of root production for the tree as it expands. Hmm. I mean, this thing is... This is really impressive how much this, this trunk buttresses, but this is what you would expect. This is exactly what you would expect. When you have a tree that's been in a container a long time like this, to get these really nice flared out buttressing trunks, is it's almost natural for the way that they... Ah, there it is. So check this out. So right as we get down, right as we get down into this, notice how this flares out into this piece. Mm -hmm. You've got this piece right here. I want to make sure that there's not something else down here that's going to be better. That would encourage me to take that piece off. That right? top root there? Yeah, this root right here. Uh -huh. 
but you start to get to this nabari that starts to spread. And when we talk about nabari, obviously that's surface roots here that give the give the tree the impression that it's gripping the ground. But that nice little a nice little shift right there is exactly what I'm looking for. So I've really got to I've really got to acknowledge that this is here. But I also need to be aware of this because there may not be another piece down here that has that same basal flare. Mm -hmm. But check this out. Now when I go a little bit lower, mm -hmm. and it's tough to see because it's dark, I do ha in fact have a beautiful root down here. So what that means is I can take this piece off, and that now moves my nabari further down to here and gives me a far superior base. So the whole process of this is just like constantly exploring and feeling out where all of that exists and how far down we need to take it to access that, right? Mm -hmm. And that looks so really obviously good. with that root right there, like like you wouldn't go be underneath that. I wouldn't that go underneath it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can, I want to try and take off those crossing roots and roots that have some flaws in them. But we also have to recognize too that we've got to leave the tree enough of a root system to be able to sustain itself mm -hmm. after this operation. So if we're going down that far, I'm assuming that this little disc of roots right here is really going to be what sustains the tree moving forward. And for a deciduous tree. It's so interesting. When you look at a deciduous tree every single year, it's going to produce all of these leaves out of this trunk, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the question is, where, where are the resources stored that lead to the production of those leaves every year? And most people would say they're stored in the roots, and that's, that's not true. Because if they're stored in the roots, how could you go in and bare root a deciduous tree every year, cut its roots back as heavily as you cut back a maple or as heavily as you cut back a beech, or, and then have it continue to produce fresh new growth without any photosynthetic ability whatsoever if all the resources were stored in the roots. This is a really poor explanation. In my hearing vascular system here? <laughs> mm -hmm. Your hearing vascular mm -hmm. system, you're absolutely mm -hmm. hearing vascular system. This is exactly, mm -hmm. exactly the concept. Mm. Yeah. So I mean this thing was buried up to here. Now you see that the base is actually all the way, I mean that's all new. But look at how much so much movement and beauty that we just captured by coming up that far. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome, right, Arthur? You're getting pretty thin though, huh? I just want to be real careful as I'm trying to tease out this base that I don't scar it up because that's going to be what you're going to see. We want that as it gets cleaned up after this operation to turn that bright white that the rest of the tree is turning. Any of those scars that you make with a misstep in your chopstick are going to be seen. All right. So you guys could see that when we were doing that, we had to. You know, there's a lot of strategy to that, and it's always interesting to watch people. There's a big, there's a big line of separation that you've got to draw between conifers and deciduous, and a lot of it centers around this fragility of that smooth bark. So while you guys were watching that, Troy and I started setting this up to be ready to accept trees, and Ricardo's going to bring us in close here. So we laid down a layer of aeration size particles to let that oxygen exchange occur through the drainage screens, the bottom of the container. Now we're coming over the top of that with just a real thin layer of interior soil. Now some of these beech are actually going to be planted in the container itself and some of them are going to be planted on the rocks. So we've got to have that system in place in the container in order to be able to facilitate that. So I'm going to rotate here. Ricardo stay in close with me so that we can kind of show this. I really want to be just a single layer on top and since these stones are in the way it starts to become a lot more problematic to get that even nice shallow, because we are planting trees in the container, very shallow amount of soil. This is an extremely shallow container. 
extremely shallow amount of soil so that we don't boost those up too high. And we need to get that evenly distributed across this whole base of the container. Now it's obviously not as significant and important to get it done in areas where the trees aren't going to be immediately planted. But once we start putting trees on the rock, we're going to lose the ability to come back in and work on this interior section. We want to get this all set up really beautifully right now. So I'm going to rotate this and show you guys. You can see some of the tie points are over the stone, some of the tie points are through the stone. Every single piece is anchored on stone. We've got one layer of thick particles on the bottom to give us that oxygen exchange through the soil column. We'll talk about that at another time as well. You're about ready for surgery. Getting ready. We're getting ready. <laughs> getting prepped. This is, this is the <laughs> how scalpels are sharp, sharpened, masks, gloves, <laughs> right? Okay, so that gives you an idea. Arthur, take us back out. Now you guys will notice that we've got all of these, all of these beautiful wires sticking up. This looks like a science project. So we've got to have everything prepared, almost like a chef's table for a composition like this, because we can't come back and miss something and then try to intrude on something we've already established on the stones. So Troy and I thought long and hard about the layout of all of this composition so that we have everything dialed for this. Now what I want to do, whenever we create a forest, we always want to start with our primary trees first. And we're going to build from the biggest out to the smallest and create little subgroupings of trees in one, two, well, excuse me, two, three, or, or four tree groups, okay? So we're gonna start by placing this primary tree, the largest of the trees in the forest, which you guys watched the root system get broken down in the video. We're gonna place this tree right here, and this is gonna be our pillar tree, okay? So when we go to place a tree on stone, a lot of people think that we would use muck on the stone in order to create a base for that root system to grow. But in all actuality, muck is not a really favorable media for uh, roots to grow in. It's a little bit too dense, it's a little bit too wet, doesn't give a lot of oxygen exchange. We're gonna use wet akadama in the place of muck. And the reason that we wet it is so that we create that nice, moist, cohesive nature that that wet soil gives us. So I've got a bucket here filled with water. So you can see I've got all of this soaked. I've got that nice, small, fine-grained akadama because we're going to be putting deciduous trees on a stone. They're going to be growing into a container, but that first period of time on the stone is going to be a little bit problematic. Okay, and then Ricardo, I'm going to rotate this around and I'm going to take this up onto this number one position here. Now, before I do that, you guys can see we actually have the positions of the trees marked. There's no way in a two hour stream or a 90 minute stream that we could show you guys the actual decision making behind the placement and the placement and everything else. So we've already laid this out once, but we're gonna walk you through our thought process. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put down a fairly, fairly thick, robust layer of akadama here. And I want it coating the entire stone surface. The surface that we've chalked up, right? That we've chalked up. And we've chalked up. And it, it can overlap now, right? Because these are all going to be eventually existing on it. But I don't want to leave any stone underneath the root system. And it doesn't matter how much I build this up. I'm going to build this up quite a bit just so that I've got the ability to dictate the angle of the, the first tree that I put on here. Okay. Okay, Troy, go ahead and just hold her right there. Let me step up, take a look. Angle. Okay, lean it to my left, yep, forward, go forward a little bit more, yep, and then to my left, there you go, that feels pretty good, okay, settle this down here, okay, I got you, okay, can you hold that from rotating, okay, so I want to settle that into that akadama right there. You guys see how I settled that? Almost the same as you would settle it as if you were repotting any other tree. Okay, you've got to really establish that angle. Now, one of the biggest challenges to a stone planting is having the anchors. Okay, go ahead and hold that angle right there. Having those anchors at a point where when you get that downward force, it holds that position stationary in the tree. Okay, so I'm just going to give myself pretty tight first grab 
on a really nice solid piece that's going to be under the eventual soil line of the composition. But I've got to grab to something solid to hold this. And this is going to be the foundation. Okay, what happens if you let go of that? Beautiful. Okay, let me step back and take a look. Let's try this number two tree. See if we can't get some harmony or some design synergy between these two major pieces. And if we can make this work, we're going to be, we're going to be off to the races. We're in okay, can, you, can you come back here? Hold that angle there. I'm going to go ahead and just um, snip right here and get rid of this. Nah. Okay. Yeah, that's beautiful. Give me a little bit of a lean to the left and a little bit towards me. Nice. A little bit more towards me. Very good. Okay. See how they have just a slight, just a slight inclination forward. Now, this is true of any tree when we pot up a tree or, or uh, put a tree in a bonsai container. Design-wise, if we have these actually sitting straight up, if these are actually sitting straight up, if you look at it from the front, it feels like the composition is falling backwards. So it's not just about having verticality. It's actually about having a little bit of a forward lean to offset the feeling that that's going to fall apart. Okay, how's that do? Still wants to lift off? Yeah. Okay. So let's come over the back here. Okay, give me that angle. And this is the challenge of working with a forest, getting all of these trees to hold that position. You've got multiple anchor points that you can pull on. And you're trying to give yourself as many options as possible without being obnoxious because we also had to drill the stone. Okay, now give me that. How's that? Holding that angle. Beautiful. Beautiful. I want to toy with this a little bit, but I'm going to send you guys back to see how we finished off that root system, how we packaged them up, how we prepped them and held them over for this composition. Uh, there's a few more little gems of knowledge in here. Take a look at this. When you come back, these will both be finalized in their position and we'll, uh, we'll carry on with the trees around to them. To bring out the base of a deciduous tree, you get all these roots growing up. Right? If this was the origin, when you're in nursery production, when this tree's in a small little two inch or four inch pot as a seedling, when they pot that up, they pile soil on top of that. And then they pot that up from, you know, that six inch to an eight or 12, and they pile soil up on that. And that's how you see this continue to increase. And then as you fertilize and as moss builds up, that increases the height as well. And pretty soon the original base that existed in that seedling is all the way at the bottom. So all these roots that have grown up and continue to accumulate, we just got to filter through all of those. better than I ever could have expected for the main tree of this. This is super, super duper. You know, the problem with deciduous trees, not the problem, let's say one of the charming aspects of deciduous trees. That, that's always interesting to keep in mind is just the fragility of every single piece of a deciduous tree because they are extremely delicate and fragile.
So then here, this is an interesting little thing that happens. Of course, you're gonna get these big thick roots that are gonna start to circle the container. We wanna cut those at a downward angle. If I can get my tool in there, I'll go ahead and clear this out just a little bit more. I want that cut to be diagonal with the cut facing down, right? Because if I can cut this so that that cut is facing down, I'll cut it square first. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is the roots form facing down and they can actually contribute. So I'll come back in here. Now that it's been squared up. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just gonna change the angle and make that cut so I've got a nice 45 facing down. That makes sense? Yeah, cool. Okay, well, you're gonna have to work on that. Just taking up my time. So then once I get down to this, once I'm down here pretty close, Troy, mm -hmm. I'm gonna come back in and I wanna free these up. And we won't totally bare root these because we'll come back tomorrow when we're placing them on the stone come back tomorrow and make any necessary adjustments that we need to. So you're saving the sides, sides because, I mean, we don't really know how far up we can go. And once we establish how the height that we can go, and then we can, we can... Then we can come down and start yeah. making decisions, sure. If yeah. we did this right now, then it's like we're pretty much... Would that have made a... a um, Done what? If we were to clean the sides off first. Yeah, it's always nice to leave a little bit of something for the tree to continue to feel comfortable about. But I am, notice that I am breaking up the sides a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you didn't break up the sides right, right at first, you know, you wait. No, no, out. let's start, you know, I think the key here is start from the top and then work your way down. And then as we're coming down, we can start to make some of those decisions. Because had you started with the sides, boy, that would have been, would have been a little crazy. But this thing is gonna have a super nice, really beautifully compact root system. So once I work that top down into the, the Nabari, and I know how deep my trunk goes before I get that beautiful root spread, then I can come back. off my surface take a look at the bottom work out some of those roots on the bottom and this is another interesting thing about deciduous trees when you come back and you work on the bottom we want this bottom and this is most deciduous trees there are some deciduous that don't respond well to this but we actually want to flatten this bottom out because that's what causes this to actually expand Expand and spread. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. So now when you look at that, you see those roots nice and flat. See that? The actual trunk is flat. It must have been growing on a, potentially hit the bottom of the pot or something and actually flattened out. Look at that. That's about as, that's about as good as it gets. Now I'm gonna leave a little more rootage than we typically would might cut some of these coarser guys back to some finer. That's, that's about as ideal as you can get for the first move on a deciduous root mass of a beach of this nature. That's gonna sit in that forest and be the absolute champion tree for this. Look at that, unbelievable. So since this is going on a rock, I mean, this is gonna be repotted anytime no. soon, right? No. I mean, it's, so it's kind of like a, make that decision of how far you can go and well let's get let's get the roots contoured the, if we don't go that far this time coming back and trying to fix that is an even bigger nightmare okay so 
Where is that? Is this the water bucket? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Chiroy. Okay, Troy, can I have some of the finer, can I have some fine aluminum? Oh. Go one more layer. How's this looking, Arthur? Looks great. Yeah. Nice little package for the package of roots. Leave those guys there so we can take that off. We don't have a toothbrush out here, do we? So this bark underneath this soil, typically you'd take a toothbrush while it's wet and clean it. But on a beach, when it's been underneath that soil for a long time, it gets really, really soft. And if you came back and cleaned it now, what you'd end up doing is rubbing a large portion of that bark off. So all we need to do is take a nice spray bottle. All we need to do is take a nice spray bottle and come back in here and just blast off any of that excess dirt that's accumulated. And that ought to do it. This guy's ready. That's ready for forest planting. exactly what we're shooting for right there. Super, super beautiful. Nice. Okay, so I hope that, uh, I hope that was uh, informative in some way or another. There's a lot of little gems of information that, that we were trying to give you guys there about how to handle these things in order to give yourself the opportunity to do big projects like this. A lot of the, you know, it's interesting Obviously we have, and 
we kind of go big here with the projects that we pursue. We go big. We go big. Maybe a little bit. Maybe on a, just a little big. And uh, in order to go big, you've got to give yourself every opportunity to be successful. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the preparation and the handling of those individual steps from the beginning all the way through the process. So we've gotten both of our, our first primary trunk and our, our smaller but still uh, dominant in terms of the rest of the girth of the trees, secondary trunk. And these are kind of my two little patches of trees that form more or less slightly independent masses of trunks and primary lines in the final product. Um, so from this point forward, I want to start to construct things around these two pieces. Now one of the questions was, why would you have that primary tree so far off to the right? And my question back to you would be, why would you put it in the center? Because if we're striving in bonsai to create something natural, right, age is reflected in asymmetry. So by pulling that primary line off of center, we automatically start to increase the age of the composition that we're building, right? When you look at a young tree with all of those perfectly spaced branches, that's symmetry. But symmetry only occurs in youth. Then all of a sudden a tree starts knocking off half the branches, they get crushed, they die out because of sunlight and loss, lack of exposure to sunlight, and you start to see asymmetry as a sign of age. This is going to be an old beech forest. So as we place these next two trees, I kind of want to refer to an image that we pulled up of a beech forest to show you some of that asymmetry that we're leaning on and how those primary lines in the trunk give you that vision of that forest um, ecosystem that we're looking to recreate. So take a look at this real quick and talk you through it. Okay, so you can see that primary trunk off to the left and it's very, very common Obviously here, we're going to use the stones to delineate that differentiation between the two pieces. Uh, but here, but there, it, it's either a pathway or could have been cut out via water. It's really tough, tough to know and tough to tell. But you can see how those different clumps of trees are separated by the landmass and the landmarks that are, are present in that forest. We're trying to do a very, very similar thing with the stone. So we've got our primary tree offset to one side. We've got that secondary tree that's going to anchor another set of beech on that second layer of stone. And then we're going to build in all of those smaller trunks around those two primary features. So what I'm doing here now is I'm working in these smaller trees. Now, from where you guys are looking, the ultimate front of a forest should see every single primary line. The spaces between the trunks should be varied. The sizes of the trunks should be varied. And most of the time, the height of the trunk should be varied. But if you guys were listening to some of those dialogues that we were talking about, deciduous trees, this composition is a little bit different because beech tend to even out in terms of the top of their canopy. So we're going to explore that as we get a few trees deep into this composition. OK, every time I place a tree, I want to step back here. Excuse me for walking in front of the camera. OK, Troy, can you give me just a little shift? Now obviously these smaller trees that are existing here, give me a little more, obviously these smaller trees that are existing here, they're trying to move slightly away to get their own ray of sunshine. Now that tree in the back, notice how it deviates dramatically. We've got to rotate that. A little bit better. Okay, and then I'm going to come over the top of this here. See if I can't pull that straighter up into that composition. So there was a question a little bit earlier, how do you get the correct angles and the tie downs? We're having to be very, very creative whenever we make a forest. Troy and I, when we were putting in the tie wires today for this composition, we're thinking every single possible scenario that we could be running up against as we kind of tie this in. What so are some of the scenarios? Some of the scenarios would be right where you want that perfect tie down, you don't have an anchor. <laughs> So not only are we thinking about anchors, we're thinking about anchors to anchors and anchors to anchors to anchors. And ultimately, each one of these trees' positions in the forest hinges on one singular point that's going to give us that precise angle. Let's take a look at that. OK. That looks better. Let me go ahead and you do? Beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to dial that in there. OK, 
Okay, I'm just going to kind of wedge that in there using soil to hold that position. So now you see a little bit more of that curvature there. You see that line coming up through there. We want those informality of kind of those trunks. Really, really beautiful. So I'm going to swing you around and come in close with Ricardo over here. And you guys can see some of the menagerie of these tie downs that we're dealing with. So we've got one tie down here that we've already kind of fed through the middle of this. Okay, this is holding this tree onto the stone at the moment. It's tied here. We've left these tails on it because these could be used to tie to something in here to hold that. Now we had another tie down that came up through this hole that we were able to tie to one of these pieces attached to this tie down to the rock. So we've got a lot of different things happening in here. Now ultimately the goal is when we're finished with this area, you shouldn't see a single tie down. Okay? This tree's already tied down in the front. We've got one more wire that can come around the back. One of these guys can come up over the top here to grab the back of this, but right now, until we solidify that, that could pull that tree out of position. So we're gonna hold off on tying that down. And ultimately what you're looking for is a tie down. So when we form the circles for these root systems, a tie down to go over each side of the circle, right? Mm. So at least two points on the circle. Now if all of these are sitting on an angled stone here, the most important place to tie them down is on the top side so that we can pull that tree up this way. If we have them on the sides, that tree naturally wants to lean on that slope of that stone. If we don't have a wire that goes across this portion of the root system, there's no way to adjust the angle of this tree here. Okay? So each one of these, you'll notice where these tie downs are, they're all here so they can go over the edge of this root system over the edge of this root system now that this goes down to keep that up like this. So strategically, giving myself the flexibility to adjust. Okay, number four. And can I have a little bit of dry soil for number four since it's going in the pot? Okay, number four, I'm gonna come in here on this backside like so and give us one of these distant, distant lines. So I'm going to plant this like I would any other repot where I make my, I already have my drainage or my aeration layer. I got my center mound. Okay, I'm going to settle that in to establish that angle. Okay, and I've got my tie downs back here. So I want to leave myself some wire to come up over the top of this to tie to one of these guys to hold the angle on that slope. That's my thought process, okay? And I'm going to show you how I'm going to execute that. Okay. So if you notice, tree five is going to sit right in here on the top of this. I've got my tie downs coming right here. If I play my cards right, I might be able to use one of these pieces to come up over this edge to tie this down as well because I don't have any kind of anchor wire back here to secure that too. So I'm going to carry this over this side of the root system. Try to nestle that right down into that. See how I just wiggle that down in there? I don't want to pull it so tight that it severs those roots. Can you see that, Ricardo? I don't want to sever those roots, but I want, to, I want to nestle that in there. Okay, watch how I do this again. I'm going to lay this over and watch how I just nestle. Nestle them both and then I lock. And now I come in. Now as long as I've nestled them, they should, when I tighten this, disappear. Ugh. Right into that root system. Okay, I'm going to cut that one off because there's no reason for us to save that. And you can see how that just sunk right down into that root system there. We'll tuck these in, put a little, put a little uh, soil between the container and this root ball, and we'll be good to go there. Can you see this? Can you see this, this edge that we have here? Can you see that? This is where we're going to get a little bit creative about the way that we secure this tree to this stone. So I'm actually going to tie at a point where I've got a little bit of an edge. As long as we're pulling into the stone, it should hang on, right? Yeah. These trees came from the Willamette Valley. They I did. Correct? Yep. 
All right, so I'm going to hold here. Go ahead and let go. And watch what I do. Watch how I do this. So I've got that mound up there right now. Got a ton of, ton of Akadama right there right now. I'm going to push this side down. And watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to slide this down the hillside. See how I slid that down the hillside? That allows me to establish that angle that that trunk is occurring at. And I can just come back in here and toy with that a little bit. Find that place that feels kind of groovy. And then I can slide this guy ever so slightly over there. Just try to find, try to find that continuity here. So see how that forms that acute angle between those two trunks? In all of the other trunks and their relationships, you don't have an acute angle that tight yet. That kind of close proximity while still seeing both of the trunks is starting to be what forms that organic natural feel in our forest. You got a big space over here, you got a smaller space here, you've got a big kind of wide crotch there, and then you got this super tight acute angle, big thick trunk, smaller trunk in the front, really small trunk in the back, kind of a, a third thickness when we compare the two primaries and then another slender guy in the back. This is that variation that we're looking for. When we talk about bonsai as an art at the highest level, that, that sort of approach exists amongst the ceramics that you use, the material that you use, the woodwork that you use. And there's nobody better at this point in time in the world than Tom Benda at making really, really, go ahead and rotate that towards me. Really fine, oh, outstanding, outstanding. Really, really fine high-end ceramics. This, this fine trunk, go ahead and flatten that out for me for the camera. This fine trunk, or this slender trunk off to the right is not very interesting, but it'll get there. Maybe we'll cut it down, maybe we'll take that big thick top off of it. Maybe we'll go ahead and grow it out. It'll definitely butt up uh, Phagus sylvatica back buds very profusely, European beach very strong. I love this combination here. I love how those two trunks are working together. This feels really, really good for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, coming back to Tom though, Tom's work in my mind most intentional ceramic that's being made right now in the world for bonsai. Craftsmanship, color, quality, wood, fire, detail, you name it. Um, and actually we've queued up a few photographs. That's all hand carved. Um, no. It's all hand carved. It's all hand done. Of course There's, it is. So you would think, right, you'd think he had like some little like um, cake, cake batter, like cookie cutter. Oh, this is how you make like cookies and he just used it for bone. It's not the way it is. He not just like hand a tool. carves it's perfectly. It's all hand carved. And you can see his fingerprints in the clay. Uh, in my mind, this is one of sort of the true testament to Tom's abilities as a ceramicist. So this is a new design. So I challenged Tom with making a, a, a container that had a real similar look and feel to another foot that I really appreciated in a really common Japanese ceramic. And this was his solution, which was nothing like what I conceptualized that I wanted from him, but uh, so far superior to what I could have actually asked him for that it was just like, you know what, uh, looks beautiful. And he's experimenting with clay. You can see the wood-fired variation. Go ahead and go to that last picture. And this will give you the real flavor of the, the wood-fired variation. You Why does wood-fired make such an interesting look? Yeah, so wood-firing a container means using a very special type of clay, using, making very specific textures and colors and whatnot uh, that work in the wood fire. And you can see here that, that white glaze of the bottom pot. On the back side, it's sheer white. On the front side, it's that almost caramel looking mottled glaze because the flame, the ash, and everything combines in the wood fire process to give you the unpredictable. And so it seems like, oh, okay, so wood firing is just out of the control of the ceramicist. No, no, nope, because everything else has to be just right in order to get that product. But let's come back to the wide shot here, Arthur. Now when you guys look at this composition and the container that we've chosen, this, as far as a ceramic piece of work, although it's just a standard rectangle, is probably one of the most intense shapes that you could possibly make. The trueness of it, the cleanness of it, uh, there's no wobble, it's very strong in terms handmade. of the ceramic. What's that? It's just totally handmade but perfect. Handmade but perfect. And um, I went into a little bit of depth on this for you guys because I knew that I would freeze up here trying to think about the forest. 
So I want to show you a little, little clip where I express my thought about Tom's work and about this piece in particular for this project. I really want to show a true forest scene, but I want it to show the unpredictability of the forest. Like, well, typically you would see it like this, but you can't ever guess how a forest is gonna grow. You just gotta show, it's just like the circumstantial production of a forest, you know what I'm saying? Like. You would always assume the biggest tree would be on the tallest point in the forest, right? Mm -hmm. But what if the biggest tree is actually lower than the stone that has a bunch of small trees on it? That's, That's interesting, right? It is. That's kind of what I want this to be. Like a cantilevered stone, maybe a little bit, but you know, it would be a minor cantilever that kind of hang and went back with a bunch of little trees, but then have this big, strong tree right here, just boom with a, so, some smaller trees around it. And almost like that gave rise to that, but this is still like young. <sighs> I just don't want it to be like, here's my big tree and here's my second tree and then here's all my little trees. Yeah. It's the last thing I want it to be, you know? And the interesting thing too about deciduous forests is they're so incredibly confined by the situation of the contours of the earth. Mm -hmm. So like, you see a deciduous tree forest and you have no reason why the forest forms this round shape where it stops growing, it just stops at that point, right? But it's probably because water has settled where it's growing, so it gets enough moisture, or water has settled where it stops growing because it's too wet. Those ideas need to be really embodied in this Forest. I, I don't know what that looks like. We'll, we'll have to. We'll have to play with that tomorrow. This is nice because you get a little bit of this beige hue in here. And this is nice because you get this little imperfection. I think I actually like the other side though. It's almost like you got sun rising on this corner of the pot or something. A little bit of that morning light, the same imperfection. I think we're gonna go with this side. So I hope that helped you guys understand, you know, a little bit more about sort of Tom Benda and also- And how excited we get about yeah. Tom Yeah. <laughs> how could you not be pumped? The elation. How could you not be pumped on that kind of quality, right? Mm -hmm. um, I obviously have a super soft spot in my heart for uh, American ceramics, but um, you know, Tom Benda is raising the bar for bonsai ceramics in the Western world, and and uh, it, it's it's hard to not support the guy. I'm, I'm all about it, and I hope you guys see a little more value in his work after checking that out too. So I'm just making some just making some fairly benign cuts at the moment, trying to get a little bit more height and distance, I want a clear space. We'll come back after this whole composition is formed and actually fully prune and do a little bit of wiring. Not a lot, these trees have a lot of naturalness already. Now when we look at that, square that up for the camera here. This, is ha this has a little bit of a presence in front of that, so I'm just gonna shift this, just shift that over on that stone a little bit. You can see with one tie down, you don't totally lock yourself in. 
I can pull that back. That gives me that space back to the back. I would rather it be heavily weighted one side or the other so that I get a big space, small space, or small space, big space, instead of two equal spaces on both sides, okay? Um, so that feels pretty dialed there. Now let's lock this guy in. We've got a number of, number of options that we've provided ourselves down in here just for this particular space on the tree. So this guy is going to go right in here, butted up right against this piece right here. I'm going to go ahead and lay down a little bit of that Akadama, get that nice platform. Okay, so as you can see, this is not necessarily what I want, but we're going to be a little bit generous with ourselves and cut ourselves some slack. I've got these pieces here that I can always pull, which will increase the tightness on this area that gives me the hold through that space. So I'm gonna bring this guy back in here and you can see how those fit together really pretty perfectly. We'll come back in and make those final branch selections. We did do a little bit of pruning to prepare for this, but definitely not much. Okay, so I'm gonna hold that. That guy set right in there. I want just a little bit of space between this and that back tree. So when we go wide again, you're gonna see where we may have to fudge a little bit. So I'm not gonna overly crank on these tie downs quite yet. Because I wanna make sure that I have the freedom to be able to adjust and adapt the position here. I'm just gonna get this to hold and then I, I need to step back and get a distant view of how that works. Okay, so I'm gonna rotate. Feels good. The question is, is do we pull it more to the left to show that back trunk or do we shift it more to the right, closer to that finer trunk? So we have two trunks lined up closer here. The east coast underneath the topsoil is all stone. So what you get are these little peekaboos of stone and that's really what this composition, when it's all said and done, and that's not gonna happen tonight, obviously, but you know that we'll take care of you guys and show you where we go. Uh, that's ultimately where it's headed, is to the peekaboos, so that you guys can, can only see a small portion of the stone and have this big unit of trees and roots on top of it. I can come back and I can pull back some of this surface. So I wanna do the wiggle, notice how that buries it. Okay, I'm gonna bring this guy up right here. Go ahead and get my pliers. I want to crank this guy down. I got to get this held in nice and tight here. Okay, Troy, can you keep those wires straight for me? Ush. Ush. Okay, so that closed the gap. Now I'm going to dummy. I'm going to dummy tie this. I don't want to pull this tree away from the stone but I also don't want these wires hanging out. Now these could potentially be used in other places. I don't know where they could be used. Probably not, but I'm always, always, always in a forest planting like this gonna leave myself the option. Okay, so there's a chance this is gonna have to come up. There's a chance it's gonna have to straighten. We'll see what happens. So I'm just, I've just got that setting there. So then let's come back to E. So this will give you guys an interesting vantage point. Arthur, how does that look? That's yeah? Good. Okay, I need a little, if you can hop around there. Now Ricardo, if you can show them this, we've given ourselves a little bit of an idea of the front with that little white mark when we had this dialed. Otherwise, the angle of these trunks, this probably took us, oh, three or four hours last night, just moving these around, looking at what we wanted to accomplish, looking at the aesthetic we were trying to pull off. So in order to do this for you guys in such a short period of time, I'm guessing this composition has probably seen 20 to 30 hours of work, I would say. I don't know. What do you think, Kendall? Easily. 40. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do that same thing now. Watch closely. I'm going to lean heavily on this side. I'm going to pull this back down that hillside to get that angle that I'm looking for. Now, I've got my tie downs sitting right here that I can come over both sides of that root system. Now, this is a little different. This gives me a tie on the front like I talked about but I'm gonna have a harder time pulling this tree up this way just because of where my tie downs are on this. If I had that hitting this point dead on, it would be a no-brainer. 
That's, that's, where the tie, that's where that leverage would be. So I've got to be very sensitive to my soil down below and that amount that's underneath this root system that I keep that packed up to hold that angle. So watch closely now. I need to make sure that this holds this position. So I'm actually going to push right here. I'm going to push to make sure that nothing gets moved away from where we want it to be. And then I'm really going to crank on this to try and solidify that position and shape. Okay, and now that, that's, now that that's tight, I can come back in here, load this bottom side up with soil. Okay, so now that I've got that hold there, I'm just gonna give this a slight boost, and I'm just gonna take that excess soil that's sitting around there, I'm gonna push that up underneath that. You see how that's working there? Just pushing that right underneath that. Okay, so that solidifies it. Now, what's gonna happen? Where this is high here and this transition down to this tree isn't very nice, I'm just gonna come in and I'm gonna take the top of that off and really ease that transition so we go boom, boom, into that next tree. Almost so that root system is funneling water into this next tree. Still a little bit of discrepancy right there, but I think what's exacerbating it is this trunk that leans off to the left. Troy, that big tall trunk in the back, can you just bring that back to your, to your left? Just straight to the left. Yeah, stop. You guys see how that changed what that smaller trunk looked like? We could sit and hammer on that smaller trunk all night, but actually the problem when you're looking at those three lines was that one that had the most dramatic lean. And that's where you've got to start to understand design and sussing out that line. So I'm going to come back here. <clears throat> okay. And since we had that root system tied, but not totally locked in, remember how I said I'm not really going to really go whole hog with it? I can just slide that root system inside of that wire. We'll come back and we'll make sure to establish that line when we insert soil. But you can see we're starting to get that beautiful distribution and composition. Now there's another thing that I want to show you, and that is from the wide angle, I want to show you from the end. So if we're doing this correctly, and I gotta come all the way back here where you guys are, we should have them flaring to the back, we should have them flaring to the front, slight forward lean on our primary trees in the middle. And this is how you establish depth. Notice the size of the trunks in the front of the composition, very slender. Notice the size of the trunks in the rear of the comp composition, very slender. That's how we give that front to back depth as well. You play with those proportions and sizes and that gives it a forest feel as opposed to a bunch of random trunks pieced together. Now typically when we see forests in the United States we see a whole bunch of crappy trees pieced together because they're crappy trees and nobody knows what else to do with them. But in all reality we should be using the highest quality material and piecing that together if we're going to make it happen. In the United States everybody puts a tree in a round pot. We got we to get away from that because the rectangle is probably the most functional shape that we could use. Why? Okay. Why is a rectangle so functional? So a rectangle typically for masculine trees is how we pull out that masculinity. And most of our collected material is masculine. It's not feminine, right? The you number see cir circle is being more feminine. Circle typically tends to hold more feminine, or it can hold a masculine depending on depending on the style of the tree. But understanding when you use a circle, that's a whole nother topic. So here you used a rectangle with feminine beach. But look at the stone. But the stone but is the stone. The stone. If you put this kind of stone in an oval, no more. The reason that I continue to show you guys. This tie down process is because I want you to see the delicacy with which we're handling the angles that we establish. The more pressure that I apply in any one location, the more I shift the angle of those different pieces of the puzzle. And I want to be very, very careful about that because you can shift them too far with the ever so slightest movement and over, over handling of the wire. Whew. Boy, that looks. That looks crazy. That looks crazy. Okay. So now this has got me dialed. You can see that slight frontward motion coming to the foreground of this. 
Now, Ricardo, can you see this big, thick, nice root here? Okay, the last thing I want to do is go right over the top of that. Now, both of these wires, when I was saying we tie wires upon wires upon wires, these are, this is a wire from here and a wire from down below here, tied here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop this under this. I don't want to crush that big, thick root. We want to take care of the roots as much as we can. I'm going to come under that, but I'm going to use this junction of wires there. I'm going to nestle that. Now if I lock this in too hard, I'm going to pull this tree back. And I just worked really hard to get that here. I may even proactively put the soil in here like we did on that other piece on the back side to hold that angle. And then I'm just going to do a real light turn. So let me rotate for you, Ricardo. Be here. As opposed to really cranking on it, I'm going to give it just a light turn to hold that position. And then I'm going to come back because now that's caused this to loosen up a little bit. I'm going to give a little bit of a lean here. I'm going to come back here. <clears throat> and really get that locked down. Notice how tight that is. Tight, tight. If you guys notice, this is a wire that's tied in here to a screw. Now, we tried to penetrate this stone all the way through so that we could anchor on the back side and pull the wire out. And we couldn't get through it with the bits that we had, which meant we probably don't want to toy with it anymore. And this particular stone, you can see, it's got a real powdery, real powdery stuff coming out of it. This is a very soft stone compared to the other two. Whenever you get into this lace rock, there's varying degrees of hardness in the stone. So we didn't push it. What we did is we tied the, the wire around the screw, stuck the screw in, and then we used this piece of bamboo to wedge that in because our direction of force is up. If it were out, it would fail. If it's up, as long as it's wedged, we can pull against that stone and still get a good tie down. About ready to put this last guy in. I want to bring this back to Ricardo. Ricardo, bring us home, baby. <laughs> Straight into the tight shot here. Home run. Home run. Now we've got a crack here. Notice that crack? That's actually going to be filled up. So what we'll do is we'll build a wall of sphagnum right here. Build a wall of sphagnum, and we'll build up this core soil column in between these stones so that we just have nothing but soil all the way down to the actual container. So we're going to bridge that with this piece right here, but then we're going to come back and make sure that that has a totally solid soil column beneath it to be able to successfully make it to the container with its roots. Now, this finagling of the tree in through all these branches starts to become the most exhausting part, excuse me, of the piecing together of this composition. Okay, T-Roy, can you just slide around here this side? You're gonna take my place. I'm just gonna make sure we got that locked and loaded exactly how we want it. Okay, hang on, I've already, I've already beat it up a little bit in terms of where it needs to go. Okay, can you hold that right there? All right, and I'm going to pull straight over here. I've got to get this tree pulled back onto the stone here. So this is going to be the first one that I tie. First one that I tie. Okay, now I'm going to do that fancy little push trick that I've showed you guys where I put a lot of pressure and weight here. Try to get that wire up onto that solid root mass there. Ugh. Ugh. Lock it in. Okay. Troy, just lightly release that and see if she falls back towards you. Go ahead and lightly release. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Excellent. Okay. We are, we are close. We are close. There is definitely a tree in here that is giving us fits. Arthur, take us back out wide, amigo. I'm going to bring it back to the front. And I just want to point out to you guys... This tree seems to be that one piece that's not really, and actually I need to get out of your way. So let me just show you that line. Pay attention to this tree right here, that line. And it's, it's kind of working against all of the other lines. So what we're gonna do, as opposed to continuing to try and hammer home on that and get it to do what we want, we're just gonna accept the fact that the root system isn't quite ready. We have that slender, slender aluminum. Oh, here it is. We're going to accept that that's not quite ready to do exactly what we're hoping for. So we're going to come back and we're going to tie that down to one of these 
tie-offs lower down at a really clean, nice angle. So I'm going to come up here to the top, just around one of these pieces. Ricardo, go ahead and frame up where I'm hooking this. I just want people to see how delicate this is. Okay, so just really nice and delicate. I want to keep that wire super, super nice and straight. The more kinked up and the more you handle it, the worse it gets. And I'm just going to wrap it right there. Now this, this tie will just be smashed into the soil right there, so I'm not super worried about its visibility. This piece right here where I'm dragging my chopstick down, that's the line that we fixed, and we just took it ever so slightly that way. So I want to go ahead and rotate this for you guys, and I want you to pay attention to the forward leaning, the backward leaning, the angle of our primary trunks. Just take a look at this from the 360. I'm going to go nice and slow so you guys can kind of see it. Notice how they're flaring forward, they're flaring backwards. Got that even distri or uneven distribution of spacing between all the trunks. Some are a sliver, some are a large gap. If we had to change the distance between three trunks, we would pull one short, leave one long in terms of spacing. Never equally spaced between three primary lines in the trunks. And we're going to end up probably creating two separate elevations in terms of these two different patches of trees. The one on the left with that secondary trunk is going to be a little bit shorter. We'll pull this down a little bit and we're going to probably level off right here. We're going to pull this down a little bit but have it just another step up. When you guys fly into the east coast and you see those mixed forests of deciduous there, you don't see a mixed forest with trees this big and trees this big and trees this big and trees this big. You kind of see this even soft undulating canopy to that forest. That's really what I want in this composition when it's finally finished. So tonight was all about the primary lines, right? From this point forward, secondary branching, tertiary ramification and formation of the silhouette and canopy is going to be our priority. Tomorrow we'll come back in, we'll integrate soil into all of this, we'll use sphagnum moss to hold that soil, we'll top dress it with our standard graded up moss sphagnum mix so that we can start cultivating the top dressing over the top of it. We'll record that process for you guys and although it's not going to be a part of next week's stream, we'll probably give you just a little bit of a finished product so check back with us next week and, and see what it, it eventually ends up with. If you don't see it there, it'll be on Instagram and, uh, and probably Facebook to show you the finished product. Next week, come back. We got Austin Heitzman in the studio who's going to be uh, dropping, some, dropping some serious knowledge on you guys about woodwork. And um, if you guys don't know Austin and you've never heard him talk, uh, you're going to want to tune in because he's a very impressive individual and we're excited to have him here uh, working with us and sharing some of what he knows with us. Uh, until then, have a great week. Happy uh, end of January. Thank goodness it's almost over. And uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. All right, lots of love to you guys. Thanks a bunch.